What a, what a privilege it is to, to have this man here. You know, there's a lot of good athletes that, that have come through this old county of ours. You know, Jim Rice and Larry Nance and Mark Dixon and Sammy Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> This is a good guy right here, man. What a humble guy, and uh, man, what a what a pleasure it is to, to get to know him and to talk with him and to have you here in our pulpit today, brother. Thank you, man. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank each and every one of you members here. Uh, I told Mark when I first came in the door that I felt like the only time I ever got nervous when I fought was from the dressing room to the ring. Once I got in the ring, I was fine. I was comfortable, but. I was scared to death from the dressing room to the ring. And on the way here, I told my wife, I said, I'm so uncomfortable. She said, that's God dealing with you. She said, you're just gonna have to be, be strong and be confident. And uh, I, I, I thank you for having me back. Uh, I, I remember back as a child, we would, uh, we would go to our kin people's homes and we would see the kids in the yards playing and we'd pull up and they'd hurry in the house and, close the doors and we'd knock on the doors and they wouldn't answer the door. And I asked my mom, I said, we know they're here, why won't they open the door? Because y'all so mean. <laughs> she said, you, you tear up every toy they, ha they got in the house, you tear up the house, and she said, y'all just so mean, we just, I can understand why they don't open the door. But uh, thank you for having me back again. And that, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. Uh, buckle up, it's a roller coaster ride because my life was up and down and up and down and up and down. But thank God now it's up. And, but uh, uh, my life basically was just like anybody else's. It, as a child, we were, we were, me and my brother were, I don't know if there was something wrong with us or we were just, I don't, we were just mean. And, but, uh, and I was really mean to my brother. I, I tried to make him, be, uh, make him be in line. And even though I wasn't in line, I was trying to make him behave. But uh, I was really rough on him as a child. But I was interested in sports at an early age. And I played all sports, football, basketball, and baseball. Uh, I never excelled at any of them except basketball. And then everybody outgrew me. Uh, I stayed short and everybody else grew, but uh, I did really well as a, as a youngster in basketball. I made the all-star team as an eight-year-old in Pelzer, and uh, we got to play at the halftime of the Harlem Globetrotter game. And I won most valuable player in the all-star game. And I really had, really was looking forward to a career in basketball, but like I said, everybody grew and I didn't. I was small. and. I always felt a need to prove something because I was small. Uh, I wanted to prove that I could run as fast as you, I could hit as hard as you, I could do anything you could do, I'm as strong as you. I felt a need to prove something. And uh, I never really had a point to prove, but uh, I just had that need to prove it. And uh, later on in life, I got got into, uh, into my teen years and I started to drink and I started I can't say I hung with the wrong crowd because I think we all have a mind God gave us all a mind we have a choice you know we can hang with who we want to hang with we can be with who we want to be with but uh, I started to drink and uh, I I drank a whole lot and then my my father was a detective with the sheriff's department and uh, you know, he told me, he says, you're making me look really good out here at my job. He said, the things I try to keep people from doing, you're doing. And he said, uh, I hope you grow up one day. And uh, my father was my hero. My, I, I miss my daddy so bad. He, 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 was, he, was, uh, he, wasn't the, he wasn't the cool father that went along with the things you did. He was the father that, that set an example and wanted you to do the things that was right. And uh, that's the big thing today with young people. We, 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 want a, we want a parent that's cool. We want a parent to do drugs with us. We want a parent to drink with us. We want a parent that, that, that does all the wrong things with us. But, you know, the, the thing about it is setting an example for someone is what you should do. And, and I wasn't doing that in my life. And 
as I got as I got older, uh, I fought. I I don't know what was really there was something inside of me I can't explain, but I just wanted to fight. I was like Geronimo. Geronimo led his people into fights. He knew he couldn't win, and I just and they said that Geronimo just wanted to fight, and that's the way I was. I just wanted to fight, and. Um, Everywhere I went, I was dreaded. People hated to see me coming because they knew it. And all my friends, they didn't want to go anywhere with me because they said, we're going to wind up in jail or we're going to wind up in trouble because you're going to get in a fight. I know at Palmetto, where I went to high school, um, friends would say, who do we play tonight? They said, who cares? Sammy's going to get in a fight. <laughs> so, and uh, it, was, it was that bad. Uh, on my basketball team, I got kicked off the basketball team. I got in a fight with two of my own teammates. And I had my, my manager, I mean, my coaching manager at the time told me, he said, uh, I've heard about you fighting all summer long out in the street. And he said, if one more time and you're off this team. And well, he kicked me off. And. Uh, but I'll never forget, he came to one of my, I told him that day he kicked me off the team. I said, you know, one day you're gonna pay to see me do something. I said, one day you'll pay to see me do something. And I remember when I won the U.S. Southern Championship here in Anderson, uh, after the fight, people would come by and congratulate me and things. And, and uh, I looked down and there was my basketball coach. He said, you made me eat my words. It cost me 40 bucks to get in there. <laughs> But, um, you know, basically, my life was uh, really a wreck. And uh, I, m I met my manager, Nick Nicomito. I met him, and uh, he came looking for me, as a matter of fact, in Williamson. He moved here from California. He had a boxing club. And he moved here, and he wanted, he, he went to the courthouse and asked the people at the courthouse, who are the meanest boys, the troubled kids, the ones that give, the police the most trouble. And he said, my name came up every other person he asked. <laughs> and so he came looking for me in Williamson and, and he left his card. He owned a restaurant and a bar and he left his card with me and said, tell Sammy to come see me if he wants to fight. So I thought he wanted to fight personally, me and him. So. Um, I went, I got a couple of buddies and we went to his bar and I told him, I said, well, here I am, what you want to do, let's go, let's go outside. He said, whoa, 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 he said, I don't want you to fight me, I want you to fight for me. And he got to explaining about the boxing thing, asked me to come to the gym and I, I was like, okay, I will, and I didn't really want to. I wanted to, I wanted to continue doing the things I did, drinking and partying, having a good, good time with my friends. So finally one Monday I decided to stop at the rec center. It, it was the YMCA, the old YMCA downtown Anderson. And uh, I went in and I had that bad attitude. Um, I told him, I said, I can whip anybody you got in here. And he had about 20 guys working out. And uh, he said, well, pick one you think you can whip. I said, you pick one you think I can't. <laughs> so he brings over this big, big, 220 pound guy, six foot two, brings him over and so we sparred and uh, I got the best of this, of this guy and Nick accused me, he said, you know, you have fought somewhere, I can see it in you, you fought somewhere. I said, yeah, I fought in the street. He said, I've never had gloves on before. And he said, but you've, you've got something that I, I just don't see in other kids. He said, you need to come back. Well, I'm thinking I ain't coming back because this guy done busted my head up pretty good. He gave me a headache and I, I was thinking I want to hurry up and get out of here. But uh, I came back that following week and I, eight years later, you know, it ended. But I um, started out uh, my amateur career and my first five amateur fights, I had beaten the three best fighters in South Carolina. My manager had so much faith in me that he felt like I could beat anybody, even, even when I first started. And he put me against the toughest competition in South Carolina early, and I beat them all. And things were going really good, and so he said, uh, we're gonna fight in the Golden Glove tournament. I said, Nick, I've only had uh, six fights. 
seven fights. He said, it don't matter if, if you're scared, stay home, but you're gonna fight in that tournament. So I went down there and I fought. It was in the open division. You had a prison representative. You had the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Marine champions all in this tournament. And all these guys have 150, 200 fights, and I've got seven. And, but I wound up winning the Golden Gloves. I won three fights and won the Golden Gloves. And I won, I won the AAU tournament. I got beat in the uh, regional tournament. And then I, a year later, I fought in the uh, Golden Gloves again and won it again and won the AAU tournament again. And I lost in the regionals again. Uh, I wound up with a 34-2 and two record as an amateur, and I knocked out 24 out of the 32 I won. And I was known as a puncher. I didn't know a lot about boxing. Nick kept telling me, you're going to have to learn to box, son. He said, you're going to have to learn to box. He said, you're going to be answering the phone when it's not ringing. He said, you're going to get a headache. He said, you're going to have to learn to box. So I turned professional. I, uh, in 1980, we had a conflict with Russia. Isn't that ironic? We had a conflict with Russia, and uh, Reagan decided that we were going to boycott the Olympics. So I wanted to try for the Olympics, but once the boycott took place, I decided to turn pro. My first professional fight I fought in Spartanburg. I fought a, a boy that was bigger than me. He was about 20 pounds bigger than me. And uh, uh, we fought, and I won by a knockout in the fourth round. And uh, about 15 minutes after the fight was over, he collapsed into a coma and had to be rushed to the emergency room. They had to perform surgery and remove a blood clot from his brain. And he stayed in a coma and died 11 days later. And uh, that was the way my professional career got started. It, uh, you know, I wanted to be known in boxing circles, but I didn't want to be known that way. And <clears throat> so I went on with my career. I went out to Vegas to get away. We, we fought in Vegas a couple of times. We came back and we fought in various uh, cities. We fought in Michigan. We fought in Florida. North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And uh, my career got, got to going pretty good. And I won my first 13 professional fights before losing. And, uh, it, you know, everything was just, it was just like it was just laid out for me. It was like what I was really meant to do. And I was getting all this attention, and I was getting all of my name in the newspaper and being on the radio, and all this glory was coming to me. And I never thanked God once for it. Not one time did I ever thank God. And, uh, you know, it, it puts me in mind of King Belshazzar in the Bible. You know, it says in the Bible that he was given everything. Babylon was the, the most powerful kingdom in the world at the time. They were the richest kingdom in the world at the time. So he threw a big party to celebrate, and he wanted all all the concubines and all the women around him. He wanted everybody there. And all of a sudden, there was a hush over the crowd, and there was some handwriting on the wall from an armless hand. And everybody was, everybody was uh, freaking out and didn't know what to do about it and didn't know how to explain it. And finally, Dan, uh, finally uh, King Belshazzar's mother came in and says, I know someone who can interpret that. And she said, there's a man named Daniel. In the fifth chapter of Daniel, it'll tell you this story. But Daniel, Daniel came and King Belshazzar told him, I'll make you the third ruler in line in, in my kingdom. I'll give you all this. I'll give you that, the riches of this kingdom. If you'll interpret this, he says, you keep your riches. Give it to somebody else. He said, I don't want to. He said, I'll interpret your dream, but you're not going to like it. And he told uh, the handwriting on the wall was many, many tekel you farsen, which meant that he had been found wanting, and he's through, he's finished. God told him he, he was finished, he was done with him. He had given him opportunities to, to give him the praise, and he never would. And he said, you've been found wanting, and he said, your kingdom will be divided by the Medes and the Persians. And that night, as as they were speaking, the river was dried up and the, the forces come across the river and took his kingdom and killed him. 
and I sort of relate my life to King Belshazzar's, but I was the lucky one. He spared me, he let me live. He gave me a second chance, he gave me another opportunity. And uh, I, I never gave him the praise, and I, and I realized at that time how much farther I could have went if I'd have been, if I'd have been working off of God's glory instead of my own. And it was all about me. I, I never thought about any. All I thought about is what I could accumulate money-wise, uh, all the women I could get, all the cars, fancy cars I could drive. Uh, it was all about me. I never once gave God the glory. And uh, so, you know, uh, I had an opportunity to fight on ESPN on national television in front of millions of people. I fought three times on ESPN. I fought for the ESPN championship. And back in those days, if you were ESPN champion, you were next step was world champion. You were one couple of fights away. And at that time, Sugar Ray Leonard was the champion. And I was that close to getting a shot at his belt. And uh, so all I had to do was win that championship. And uh, I had already got to thinking, if I win this fight, I'm going to be fighting for hundreds of thousands of dollars. What kind of car am I going to buy? You know, I was right back to me again, right back to what, what I could do, what I could get for me. Not once thinking what I could do for somebody else. So I lost the fight to Louis Resto, and I, I'm, I'm not putting up any excuses, but he was caught cheating two months later in a fight that he had taken the padding out of his gloves and ruined the boy's career and caused the boy to go out and commit suicide. And I know he, I just know he was hurting me the night I fought him. I'm not going to say one way or the other, but I know he was hurting me. And uh, uh, my opportunity slipped away. You know, that was the opportunity from going from medio mediocrity to greatness. And uh, I realize now that God had a plan for me, and he, he saw the path that I was on. And if I was destructive in the little bit of fame that I had locally, what would happen if I really got to be famous? I, 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 I can honestly tell you that I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be standing here giving this speech. And uh, I, you know, I, I never thought about anything. I, I, I slipped into depression after losing that fight. I had to start over. The very next fight, Nick Warner told me, he said, I'm not gonna let you wallow in your own pity. He said, you're gonna fight. I'm gonna keep you sharp. So I fought a guy that was undefeated, 12 and 0 with 12 knockouts. Fought in Charleston. He knocked my nose over here. It was way over here. He broke my nose, knocked me down, beat both eyes shut, but I won the fight. I got up off the floor and won the fight. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think back, everything that happened in my life was biblical because I think about the letter Paul wrote to Timothy and told Timothy, I've fought a good fight. I finished the race and I've kept the faith. But I never had no faith. I never had faith in Jesus. I never had faith in God giving me the ability to do the things that I did. I would have never been a good fighter if it hadn't been for the Lord. And I never <clears throat> I never recognized that. We get caught up in our own self. I was as narcissist as you could be and uh, you don't see that until, you know, the bottom falls out. Well, I got into drugs. Uh, I had never smoked marijuana. I was 24 years old, never smoked drugs, smoked pot, never done anything like that. I got into smoking pot, and then I didn't want to go to the gym and train after I would do that. So I decided I don't, I'm going to do one or the other, and I chose the wrong one. I gave up the boxing career. I still had a lot of good years left a lot of money to make, a lot of fame to make. That's what I was still seeing all this time, what I, could, what I could do for me, not what I could do for anybody else. And so uh, then I got into cocaine, and when I got into the cocaine part of it, it, the bottom did fall out. I mean, I started to, I was married, and I had two young children, and Sammy and Nikki were uh, just babies, and. I was still running wild and going to bars and girl after girl after girl and me being married, you know, that 
everything that you was not supposed to do, I, were, I was doing. And um, then I, all of a sudden I made a mistake and uh, sold uh, drugs to an undercover agent. And uh, I went, I had, and my father come and told me, he said, I got a warrant for you. And he said, you go, you go on with me. So my daddy took me to the authorities himself. And uh, I was sentenced to prison. I went to prison. I, I, I woke up one morning and realized I had this out here. And then I woke up and I was in pits of hell. That's what I thought. I was really in the pits of hell because Perry is a, Perry was at that time was the worst prison in South Carolina. And so I did my, I did my sentence. I got out. Still no. No glimpse of God in the picture. Still no, no direction in life because I, I wasn't, I didn't get rehabilitated and I didn't learn anything. I just got a little slap on the hand and got out. And I wound up going back to prison three different times. And uh, the third time I went to prison, uh, that third time is the was the turning point in my life. I called home. And my mom answered the phone, and she told me, she said, son, she said, we've done everything we can possibly do for you. We've given you, we've paid bills for you. We've given you, we have spent $100,000 on you in the last 10 years. We have done all we can do. We're through. We love you, but we're through. We're not coming to see you. We don't want, we, until you change, we don't want anything to do with you. And that really hit home because when you, when you, parents turn their back on you it, it's something serious and uh, I didn't r really know how to react to all of that I just I remember going back to my room and just laying in the bed and thinking well they'll come around they'll come around eight months later nothing um, so a friend of mine named Todd came by one day at Perry and, and Todd had a real bad reputation he had stabbed up a couple of people in jail and but he had turned his life over to the Lord, and he had he had changed his life, and uh, I didn't know that Todd that before. I knew the Todd that I had seen, smiling and happy and talking about the Lord everywhere he went. I've got a friend in here now named Tony Ellenberg, and uh, Tony was one of my biggest inspirations in life because we hung together, we ran together on the streets. Tony wasn't into the drug thing, but we drank and we we partied and we raised cane and did crazy things. And Tony joined the Navy and came home from the Navy and told told us he had gotten saved. And well, we all took it with a little grain of salt, you know. He'll he'll be back to being like us. But uh, Tony never wavered. He n not once in his life did he ever waver. He was who he was. He was a child of God. And he, he talked to us about the Lord, and we used to see him come, and we'd go, oh, Lord, let's go. Here he comes. <laughs> but but uh, Tony, would, Tony would always talk about the Lord. And me and Tony talk on the phone now a couple of times a month, and it's always about the Lord and what he's done in our lives. He gave him a beautiful wife. He gave me, I prayed, when I was in prison, I prayed to God that he would not let anything happen to my mother and daddy until I got out and showed them that I, I had changed. I got on my knees and I asked the Lord to come into my heart in, at Perry. I said, change me, I can't do this. I've, I've made a mess of my life. I'm broken, I can't do this. And he came into my heart and it seemed like everything at that from that point on just fell into place. My mom and dad started to come back to see me and we put back a relationship. I remember making parole from Perry uh, I, before the, before I went back the third time. I remember making parole and I called home and I told my mom, I said, you know, I don't believe this. I just made parole. Oh Lord, we're not ready for this. <laughs> I said, I'm not either. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready to give up the things I was doing. I wasn't ready to give up that kind of life. But, but once I got on my knees and asked the Lord to come into my heart, he did, and he changed it. The, the thing that hurts me the most 
is my daughter is sitting, they're sitting here now. When she was three years old, she saw the police handcuff me and take me away from her. And she was crying and begging, please don't take my daddy away. And she came all the way to McCormick to see me when I was in prison and they wouldn't let her in because my mom didn't have the correct paperwork. My mama told me she cried all the way home. And uh, when I got out, you know, you just can't get out and become a parent. I didn't know how. I was never a parent to Sammy and Nikki, and I was never a parent to Jana. I never saw them start the first grade in school. I never saw them go to kindergarten. I never got to see that. And, but then all my kids seemed to want to follow in my footsteps there for a while. They all got off, off on the wrong path. My son wound up going to, uh, Baptist College in Nashville, Tennessee, and getting a degree in theology. And my oldest daughter, she, she does really well. And Jana is the one I'm most proud of because she turned her life around 180 degrees. She was out there doing, she was out there being Sammy Horn, and uh, she got pregnant with my grandbaby. And she, t she did a 180, I mean, she turned her life all the way around, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing what she has done, and I love her, and I'm so proud of her. But the person that I'm most proud of is my wife, because my wife, I mean, <laughs> she grew up in West Virginia, and we make fun of people in West Virginia, but they make fun of people here. <laughs> she, she said, we don't talk near as bad as y'all do. But uh, she, is, she is my rod, she's my backbone. And my son Solomon, I have a nine-year-old, and my son Solomon is everything that I got an opportunity. God gave me an opportunity to be a parent, to be a father. I never knew how. I never, I never wanted to know. I didn't want responsibility. I didn't want any kind of responsibility. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to live my life. And God's made me understand that people, you know, he, a lot of people will never see Jesus unless they see it through somebody that, and maybe I'm, I could be that person. Well, my son, my wife took him to Belton. She went to Belton one day, and she said he was hungry, so he wanted to go by Burger King and get some chicken fries. He loves chicken fries. They started up the road, and he begged his mama, pull over, pull over, and she said, why? He, she, just, she pulled in the CVS parking lot, and he jumps out and runs up to a homeless man and says, I know you're hungry. He says, I know you need this. And he gave him them fries and got back in the car. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? The right example, his mother, his mother and myself, she stays on me. She says, you're still not setting the right examples all the way. You need to do more and you need to do better. It's the same in my Christian walk. I, I don't, we all fall short of the glory of God, and I know I do. Amen. I'm not the Christian that I should be. I should be a better Christian than I am. I should, I should every day strive to be better than I was yesterday. And, but God has done a lot in my life and he's blessed me so much. I mean, I cannot get over how much he's blessed me. I see Lynn, Lynn Starnes Bishop that's sitting here in the audience today. I remember watching her play softball and take insulin shots. And I, and I never knew that she, had a, she would be attending a, a, a service that I would be speaking at and I, I have some wonderful friends and I have wonderful I have a friend named Trey Fisher that he Trey is uh, a paraplegic he had a car accident and he's been paralyzed from the neck down but Trey is a inspiration to me he's a fighter he hangs in there he's tough and I'm I want to I want to be a fighter but I want to be a fighter for the Lord I don't want to fight I don't want to fight any more battles that I ha don't have to, and I always, it seemed like every, everything that I did in my life was self-inflicted. I could have done things different, but I didn't know about the Lord. I didn't have a clue. But now that I do know about the Lord, I couldn't make it from day to day without it. I, I cannot make it, and, and I realize I never wanted to rely on anybody's help, but I do rely on Jesus, oh, and I will. And I thank y'all for this opportunity and thank you for letting me come speak. Thank you.